afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our PIOC online discussion session on the impact, uh, economic impact and financial aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. My name is Patrick Malejac. I am the Secretary General of PIOC. We are very happy today to have a number of very distinguished panelists, and I will get back to that later. Some basic rules for Zoom online meetings. Uh, please be sure to mute yourselves and to keep the video off during the presentations so as to avoid background noises and connection overload. Please use the chat functionality and ask questions at any time. We will collect them and direct them to the panelists during the Q&A session. And please be sure to have your full name and country displayed uh, under your ID here in Zoom as an audience member. There are instructions here on the screen. Let me guide you through them briefly. Click on the participants icon at the bottom of the window, then go to rename. And there you can rename yourself. Please include your uh, first name, surname, and country so that we know uh, who is in and so that other participants can, can interact with you. So as a reminder, please turn off your microphone and the camera at all times. Uh, please ask questions. Asking questions is strongly encouraged. You can use the chat feature of Zoom for that, and you can send a message to all participants, which is one of the options. This channel is monitored by Christos Xenophantos, who is the chair of our Committee on the Performance of Transport Administrations. Uh, Christos will raise the questions to relevant panelists. About your name in Zoom, as I just said, please identify yourself accurately because this really fosters interaction between participants. The session is being recorded and the video will be shared afterwards on our website at pr.org. A general disclaimer then, uh, we know that time is of the essence, uh, this is a crisis, and it's likely that knowledge and practice that is going to be shared today will not have been officially approved by each country's official authorities. This is something that we have to live with. This is why the ideas and examples shared here today are for illustration only. They do not necessarily represent official policy. They will be subject to further evaluation at PIOC, and we will use them in deriving recommendations on policy and practice in due course. Of course, care has been taken in the preparation of the material, but we cannot accept responsibility for any damage that may be caused. The key concept is to focus on the short term. We're going through a crisis and every day counts. Sharing knowledge and current practice between PIAC members is what we do usually. It's, it's urgent in order to support responses to the pandemic in the real time. Such knowledge and practice may not have been confirmed as valid or effective. And please bear in mind that what works, works in some parts of the world may or may not be relevant elsewhere. But we firmly believe that inspiration can be found anywhere and that a good idea now that you would see here or elsewhere that would give you inspiration could help you save lives, could help you improve your business resilience, and could help you minimize disruption of your services. In parallel, at PIOC, we are planning medium and long-term actions for when the pandemic is in a manageable state and more under control. We have set up a response team, about a dozen colleagues, uh, PR committee members, secretaries, or chair, have joined me and set up that team with, with whom we've organized a number of uh, webinars and uh, published a number of notes and uh, articles. Uh, I invite everyone to turn off your video camera. Thank you. The agenda structure of the session today, there will be a brief introduction to PR and to the structure of uh, the issues uh, faced by road operators and administrations. Then the core uh, of our session today will be four panel presentations on the legal aspects and contract remedies, on the situation in France, on post-pandemic recovery and the impact on potential mitigation actions, and how to assess road investments and activities in the post-COVID-19 era. That will be followed by a question and answer session and uh, then conclusion and next step. Our speakers today include well, myself. Uh, sorry, that's a mistake. Uh, our speakers today 
uh, here on the screen, uh, our colleague Francesco Chiodone from the Kiark Committee on Finance and Procurement. From that same committee, our colleague uh, Jean-Max Gillet, as well as Flavio Di Pietro, and Fabio Pasquali, who is also a chair of one of our committees, the Committee on Road and Transport Planning for Economic and Social Development. Thank you very much to uh, these colleagues for having, having made themselves available. And since we have newcomers, I invite you everyone again to take, uh, to take note of these recommendations. Please turn off your microphone, turn off your camera, and uh, please be sure to have your full name and country displayed uh, under the Zoom uh, name feature. And do use the chat function to ask questions at any time. So I will move forward quickly to get to uh, uh, my presentation. So what is PIARC? PIARC is the new name of the World, World Association. We were founded in 1909, so more than 110 years ago now, as a non-profit, non-political association. Our goal is to organize exchange of knowledge on all matters related to roads and road transport. This is what we're doing today, by the way. Uh, this leads to four key missions that have been assigned by our members to be a leading international forum for analysis and discussion of all topics related to roads and road transport. It can be road safety, can be pavements, can be performance of administrations, can be planning, can be financing, can be urban transport, many things. We currently have about 20 different technical committees. We also intend to identify, develop, and disseminate best practice and give better access to international information. We do that, by example, for example, by sharing reports. And please note that on average, we publish one new report every month. We tend to consider within our activities the needs of developing countries and countries in transition or low and middle income countries. Uh, this means that we invite those colleagues to really express their needs so that we take that into account in the terms of reference of our work of our committees. We invite them to take part in our activities and we organize international seminars locally in those countries. Uh, and fourth mission, we design, produce and promote tools for decision making, such as HDM4 that some of you may be familiar with, which is a software tool that helps make, making uh, road related uh, investment decisions, or QRAM, which relates to the transportation of dangerous goods in tunnels. How do we do that? We mobilize the expertise of our members. Currently, we have more than 1,000 experts mobilized in uh, more than 20 technical committees. They're all nominated by their ministries, or what we call the first delegate, the highest ranking PR official in one country. Their operations, our operations, are guided by a four-year strategic plan, and I invite every one of you to uh, check that because it is available from our website. So what are the issues faced by road operators and administrations? Of course, we will discuss them in depth uh, just later, but we have identified six structuring issues uh, with the response team. Uh, issue number one is that you need to ensure employees' health and safety in general. Uh, some of your employees may be working from home, may need to work from home, and you need to organize that. Some of your employees cannot work from home. They will be working in toll booth, they will be uh, operating machinery on roadworks, and you need to ensure their health and safety anyway. You also need to uh, take responsibility for their mental health in uh, those trying times. Second issue is that you want to maintain your activity and, uh, and to maintain your business continuity. Well, in many countries around the world, the COVID-19 crisis has led to a sharp decrease in traffic uh, volumes. Uh, but nevertheless, roads remain open. Uh, even if offices are closed, roads remain open. And this is your job to organize that. And it's complex because you need employees, you need, you need uh, cash flow, you need contractors, you need suppliers, and you need customers. Um, issue number three is you need to face the impact on transportation, decreasing uh, traffic volumes. In many cases, that means uh, decreasing revenues in particular for PPPs. Uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, how do you engage with your banking partners or your funding partners? And it also has long-term implication, not only short-term, but also long-term implication. For as regards uh, urban transport, for example, in many cities around the world, we are seeing a sharp, uh, we are seeing issues 
uh, with uh, customers who are less willing to use public transport because they are scared that they might catch the virus there and who are planning to rely more on their own private vehicle, which is really not what was the plan six months ago. How do we deal with that? The fourth issue is to maintain business relations. No one operates in a vacuum. You have contractors, you have partners, you have suppliers, and now you have to make sure that they all are able to operate. In some cases, you may need to support your providers and suppliers. The fifth issue relates to customer and stakeholder relations. Not only do you have stakeholder customers and you need to keep them uh, up to date on what you are doing and what constraints you might be facing and you might need to um, address with them, but you also have stakeholders. And in some cases, in most cases, you need to work with ministries, civil, um, civil security, um, health uh, departments, and in many countries, uh, road transport has been uh, deemed as an essential activity. So this all needs to be organized. The fifth issue relates to security and cyber security in particular, with many workers working from home with tools that may or may not have been carefully validated by your IT department. We know it works usually, but is that completely safe? So you really need to make sure that you stay on top of that game. All these questions were presented in more detail during previous webinars. A first note is actually available. Uh, it is a synthesis of the first four webinars and those Findings are relevant for the road community, we believe, and may be useful to inform planning and operational decisions. A second note is forthcoming and should be published this week or next week. Th that note, as, uh, as is the case with all our productions, is available from our website and it's available for free in English, Spanish, and French. So I invite you all to go and download it from pr.org. So this is all for the introduction. Uh, thank you for your attention. I invite everyone to not hesitate and ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom. And I'm very happy to invite our first uh, speaker, Francesco Chiodone, who is one of our uh, panelists uh, today to uh, deliver his presentation. Francesco, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. So following your suggestion to fulfill the, the, the aim of peer approach in, uh, in managing this kind of question, I just want to introduce that the legal aspect on uh, and contract remedies uh, will be analyzed in the perspective uh, of the committee that I'm honored to chair as the chairman of the Finance Procurement uh, Committee of the peer. Uh, giving the, the approach of uh, the experience taken by the different jurisdiction to offer to everybody a, a, a wider analysis of the impact of the COVID-19 on the construction culture. Uh, so uh, it's not necessary to introduce myself, I think, uh, uh, but uh, just uh, to give a, a look to who is speaking today from Rome and not from Paris like for Patrick, but uh, uh, the experience that I want to offer is a very, uh, is very keen on, on legal aspect. And uh, if we think about uh, what does it mean, uh, uh, the massive shock of, please Patrick, if you can, the, the, the legal qualification of COVID-19, of COVID uh, uh, we can <clears throat> analyze the different approach that are going to be taken in uh, different jurisdiction, which is, uh, uh, the, the impact of this uh, uh, this approach on uh, from a contractual point of view, and uh, finally to analyze uh, how different uh, in our, how in the different jurisdiction the government uh, are facing uh, the, the COVID nineteen. So starting from legal qualification, it is important to understand that uh, uh, the massive shock of COVID nineteen as is, is a very simple statement, is, uh, is, is affecting uh, every type of contract relations. Um, the, the, the different approach taken by the government are in the sense to leave to private enforcement to analyze the impact of the, the COVID-19 or to take care directly giving a rule on how the, the COVID-19 had to be managed in the in the implication for each contract and uh, uh, 
this, this can lead uh, to major distinction between uh, the, the, the private enforcement of the COVID-19 and to the public enforcement of the COVID-19. Uh, on the next slide, we can uh, check that uh, uh, from a legal uh, qualification uh, point of view, the, 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 the COVID-19 can be seen as an act of God. The language of, uh, uh, of the contract traditionally defined uh, the, the, the event like uh, an act of God as a force majeure. Um, traditionally, a definition of uh, this kind of event is, uh, is, is uh, uh, explicitly included, included in, uh, in the contract, but uh, for sure not specifically uh, mentioning the pandemic or epidemic or quarantine as an event that are traditionally listed in, uh, in, uh, in the contract. Uh, also because the, 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 the list of examples is a non-exhaustive non tradition. Um, so the, 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 what is possible to be done is that the, the application of the force majeure can be uh, claimed uh, and uh, uh, it's an objective criteria in definition that is for sure actually meet. Uh, such, a, uh, such objective criteria typically require that the event be uh, considered as behind the reasonable control of the affected party and that the event actually impede or delay the performance uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is in the contract. Uh, some clauses uh, also on the experience that we can have in the execution of the contract uh, uh, may require to go further and uh, uh, that is not that is also required in the, in the case of force majeure that is not uh, for reasonable by affected party when enter, entering into the contract so there are as you, as we can see in on the next slide uh, there are in, uh, 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 some uh, uh, the, the, the the first uh, uh, aspect to be uh, analyzed is uh, the definition uh, expressly included in the, in the contract. So start from the from the uh, text meaning of the contract. For example, some contracts are may provide that the party lacks of fund, however, arising or an increase in the cost of its labor material will not be deemed as a force majeure. This is a very uh, um, good example on uh, how this exception that can be also related to the COVID-19 uh, may become or not uh, included in the current pandemic situation. And uh, uh, generally saying the lack of uh, force majeure clause does not mean that uh, cannot this kind of event be invoked by the affected part because in the, in the common law system as well in the, the civil law uh, uh, regime, uh, all these kind of, uh, of, of events are in a way or in another may be invoked under the doctrine of frustration and impracticability. Uh, so it's important to start from the analysis of the contract, uh, verifying the choice of the law applicable uh, to the contract and uh, um, to verify on this basis uh, how the COVID-19 can be classified by, uh, from, a, from a legal perspective. Um, if uh, we can go through the, the legal qualification, we can see that frustration affects the purpose of the contract uh, uh, in the perspective of the executing part, for sure. Uh, and the frustration does apply to contract um, with the effect that the contract can be uh, automatically terminated uh, up an occurrence of the frustrating event. On the same time, uh, there will be uh, the impracticability uh, that affects the performance of the, of the regulation um, by, by, for sure, seen by the party who is invoking it. If force measure cannot be invoked, um, does mean that for many contracts, remain in any case the possibility to allow termination or adjustment in case of material adverse change, the so-called MIC close or material adverse effect on the value of the performance. So does mean that even if the, for, the, 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 the specific clause on force majeure is not included in the wording of the contract, it remain uh, uh, the possibility 
to, to, to invoke the, 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 the MAC and the uh, uh, MAE uh, clause to protect the, 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 the executing party. Um, these are general clause and uh, um, the, the meaning of this kind of clause is uh, to include uh, uh, without having a specific list of events, uh, the, 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 the interpretation approach uh, usually applied in the application of this kind of clause is to exclude market disruption, act of God, and uh, uh, in, in, in the new m &A contract that, that, that we have started uh, finalizing in this day, the, the impact of uh, COVID-19. COVID um, force majeure mechanism, going on the, on the next slide, uh, uh, force majeure mechanism allow for sure contractual relief uh, to the affected party. Uh, some contracts allow either party to terminate the contract uh, if uh, force majeure lasts behind a, a given period. And uh, the cost of delay are, are borne by each party and the contracts set forth for the commitment of, of each party uh, have to be uh, applied in good faith to minimize cost losses uh, that are directly or indirectly related to the force majeure event uh, invoked by the part. Um, at the same time, most contracts on the experience that we can share with you will provide that the obligation to pay money in a timely manner is not uh, ex excused by force majeure. Uh, as said before, from the beginning, uh, the government measure may impact on the application of, uh, of these clauses. Um, and it's of interest uh, to remind that uh, also at European level, the, 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 for example, the European Construction Industry Federation uh, require the, the intervention of the, of the European Commission uh, to ensure that COVID-19 is, uh, is considered a force majeure to eliminate uh, the penalties uh, for companies that have to suspend work uh, or uh, uh, providing uh, the, 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 the funds necessary to rebalance the execution of contract. Uh, this is a, a good example on how the, the private sector can uh, uh, request public intervention to regulate a, a, a global event like the pandemic that we have to face under the wording, under the wording of COVID-19 as an event um, not only to be uh, applied to the execution of a single contract, but uh, as a general event relevant for, this, for the entire uh, global economy. So if we give a look to the, <coughs> to the, to the uh, government approach that, they, uh, that, are, uh, that, uh, that can be uh, followed, uh, the COVID-19 may be invoked as an event in, the, in general construction contracts uh, 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 or as a cause of uh, uh, impracticability of the execution. Um, the, 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 the decision uh, or the measure uh, issued by the government in relation to COVID-19 uh, can be seen as a, 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 as, a, as a decision going to provide evidence to long stop date, burden of evidence, estimates. In other words, uh, uh, are for sure decision that has an impact on the contractual provisions. Um, and uh, focusing on, on the building of the delay costs may be very burdensome for the contract due to the, the increasing costs relating to the workplace safety, for example. That is one of the, the, the major area in which the COVID-19 may have impact. Uh, I, I believe that it can be useful to verify the different approach taken by the different, uh, uh, in different jurisdictions. So I, we want to share with you today the approach taken in Italy, for example, in Poland, in Belgium, and in, in Russia. So if we give a look to the, to, to, to the decision taken in Italy, uh, it's important to, to, to stress that the uh, anti-corruption authority on the 9th of, of April issued some uh, specific guidelines on how to handle public contract in the light of COVID-19. 
the guidelines specify that, uh, that, as you can see on the slide, that for existing contracts, the health emergency shall be qualified as force measure and justify the delay in the, in the performance of the contractual obligation. Um, this is a case in which the public body, so the government uh, authority, like the anti-corruption authority, decide directly to qualify the, the, the event of COVID-19 as a, a relevant force major case to be applied in the contract. So it's not lead to, to the private enforcement, uh, the qualification of the event, but uh, there is a public qualification of, of the, the COVID-19 as a force major case. Uh, going to the, to the uh, UK experience, we can have exactly the opposite decision taken by the public body. Uh, the reference is to the decision taken to the guideline provided by the Infrastructure and Project Authority uh, that, um, that on uh, the 2nd of April issued a guidance notice on private finance initiative and uh, related contracts. Uh, stressing the point that they are uh, uh, related to public services. The, the, the note clarified that the government does not regard COVID-19 as a force majeure event. So exactly the opposite of the decision taken in Italy, as mentioned before, and uh, is not an event for the purposes of uh, uh, project finance initiative or contracts that can be uh, used to justify um, not execution or delay or whatever in the execution of, of the contract. Uh, the approach taken by the infrastructure and the project authority is to support as much as possible a review and discussion between contracting authorities and the private party in charge for the execution to enable continuity and uh, uh, the execution of food services as far as possible. Uh, the contracting authority should work closely with the, with the, with the contractor uh, to verify uh, all the available options uh, to, 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 to maintain public services uh, during the, the, the emergency period. So the, the approach taken by the, the, the public or the government, by the government UK, is uh, uh, to lead to, 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 to the party uh, the approach uh, necessary to uh, maintain the execution of the contract during the time and uh, uh, to avoid uh, any general qualification, as say, of, uh, of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, crisis as uh, an event to be qualified as force majeure. Uh, what's happened in Belgium, for example, where the Flemish government issued a circular on the 10th of April um, underlying that uh, the, uh, the contracting authority that fall under uh, the jurisdiction of the Flemish government authority uh, have to, to follow uh, a way uh, as uh, uh, accelerating payments and uh, waiving penalties to, uh, to protect the contract actually in force. So the, the, they emphasize the duty for the contractor to minimize the damages in the event of exceptional circumstances uh, may face the execution of the contract and to provide evidence uh, of the circumstances that uh, are really exceptional and uh, uh, relevant for the execution of the contract. Um, there is uh, an impact of of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, in the case of uh, non-compliance with the government's uh, uh, COVID-19 measure, that can be considered a, a breach under the ongoing public contract. So we can see a, a third different approach taken by uh, the government authority. Uh, next, uh, next uh, experience is related to the, the, the Poland approach, let me say, that provide a package of measure uh, called anti-crisis shield uh, that have been amended uh, to the, that have been uh, issued to amend the public procurement law, uh, introducing the obligation of the party of the contract to inform each other uh, of the extent to which COVID-19 uh, uh, affect the performance of the contract, with the possibility 
that are traditionally not uh, allowed in public contract, but have been introduced uh, to phase uh, the emergency, uh, we, uh, as I was saying, with the possibility to amend the contract and uh, uh, to provide the right to resign from collecting receivable and exemption from penalties under the public finance discipline, uh, the policy discipline. The, 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 the next experience that I want to share with you, uh, uh, even, even not included in the, in, the, in, the, in the slide, is uh, uh, the one related to the Russian market, uh, on, on, uh, where I asked to our partner, Alexander Linokov, to provide us a, a very short commentary on uh, uh, what's going on on the construction contract. And it's very, uh, it's, it's of interest to see how the, the, the Presidium of the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation issue a, 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 a judicial approach, let me say, to the, to the pandemic uh, crisis, uh, uh, underlying the importance of uh, uh, the interpretation to be provided to force majeure events uh, that uh, have to be considered from a judicial point of view, so not lead to, to, the, to the private enforcement and not uh, directly related to a, a, a government decision, but lead to a judicial interpretation and approach uh, that will be followed, is that the debtor must be relieved from payment or related penalties if uh, the force majeure leads to inability of the debtor to perform an obligation. Uh, and uh, I repeat, the approach taken in, in Russia is that uh, the qualification of the COVID-19 as a force majeure event is lead uh, to a, a part uh, to the court judgment. Uh, and the, 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 the qualification also provided in, in, the, in the Russian case is that uh, when determined force majeure, the following circumstances are taken into account and are the one related to the type of the company's activities. Uh, the condition for its implementation, the region of, uh, of implementation, and the circumstances of, uh, uh, that are directly related to the particular case, including, for example, the deadline, the nature of the unfulfilled obligation, and the uh, uh, reasonableness of, and good faith of the action taken by the debt. On the, on the basis of this uh, uh, general overview, going back to, to my, uh, to my uh, final remarks, uh, I think that we can share uh, different uh, uh, conclusion, useful also in, uh, in, the, in the PIAC approach, let me say. Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, conclude that uh, uh, Different decisions have been taken uh, uh, through the adoption of government measure. We have seen clear qualification of COVID-19 as a, a, a force majeure event, uh, clear exclusion of the force majeure uh, event uh, concerning, for, uh, concerning the, the COVID-19, uh, the, the Russian approach that leave the decision to a, a judicial uh, evaluation to be done by, by the court, or uh, the, the private approach taken in, in Belgium and uh, in a certain way in Poland. It does mean that we have, that we have a, a very uh, different approach taken uh, uh, generally. Um, that the, but we have also to, to underline that uh, is a clear problem to be faced in the construction contracts, as, uh, as I was mentioning before, the European Construction Federation is asking for a more, uh, for a more general uh, qualification of the event. Uh, and uh, um, is, uh, is easy to predict that there will be a huge litigation, unfortunately, related to the impact of COVID-19, if well not managed by public authority. Uh, public contracting authorities and uh, a private uh, party uh, in charge for the execution of the contract. Uh, and uh, it's easy to predict that uh, for sure new contract in the construction sector will be, uh, will be written in a way that allow everybody to take care of uh, the impact of event like COVID-19 
especially if, uh, as said by scientists, uh, it's not to be excluded that uh, this kind of problem can be faced also in, in, in coming years. Thank you for your attention. Sorry, thank you very much, Francesco. That was very detailed and a very broad uh, with a wide perspective on many uh, different countries. I think it was extremely interesting and I invite everyone to uh, ask questions uh, in the chat to uh, Francesco. Having uh, said that, now let's move on to our second panelist's presentation, Jean-Max Gillet, uh, from the same uh, technical committee. Jean-Max, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, All right. perfect. perfect. Okay, so I'm going to start my presentation by presenting myself. So I'm, I'm, I work as a consultant for different companies, and one of my uh, main uh, positions is working for a company called Next Road Engineering, which is a road engineering company, market leader in France as a private company. And this company is also active in France and at an international level. So that's for my own presentation. So I'm going to start now presenting the situation in France regarding COVID-19. So the company, the, the country has been locked down until the 11th of May, which is Monday last week. And it stopped uh, the containment of the lockdown uh, from last Monday. So it means that uh, all the businesses which were uh, closed uh, until last Monday are now opened except uh, what is called social, what is meant for social contact, which means bars, restaurants, cultural spaces like museums and big malls over 40,000 square meters. The idea would be is still to contain the number of contacts that everyone can have. Schools are open for young children since last Monday and there are still restrictions if you want to travel over 100 kilometers far from where you live, except for business or special cases. So um, I've, uh, then the next slide is on the uh, situation, the map of the uh, uh, rate of contamination through the COVID in France. So we can see that most of the COVID-19 uh, impact is in the eastern part of France and the Parisian region, while the rest of the country has been uh, mainly preserved from this uh, virus. And in this red area, even in, if things are moving every day, there are still uh, higher restrictions regarding moving to uh, access forests or beaches or whatever. The situation is, is changing every day. So now, the situation from the from, from last Monday is changing and the next slide please and the business has started again but it's a very slow start so it's it's a slow start in every businesses which includes the road industry and the building industry and um, one of the reasons is that because of the message which was passed by the government uh, mid of March was very uh, was was, was uh, containing a lot of anxiety Everyone now uh, is still very anxious about uh, what, the what the consequences of the virus are. So everybody's making his own risk evaluation, I could put it this way, which means every, everyone, but also every company. And it brought to uh, political tensions to, between local governments, which is regions, departments and towns, and the central government with the prime minister and the president. And on top of that, in France, we have a special uh, situation regarding uh, spendings in roads or in buildings, which is that local elections for mayor started just before the lockdown, mid of March. And so uh, the elections in France for these kind of uh, elections have two rounds of election. We, had, we voted for the first one and we didn't vote for the second one. So it means that uh, 30,000 towns have voted over 50% for a list on the first round, but because of the lockdown, the mayors were not elected within the 30,000 uh, towns. And 6,000 towns haven't still got uh, a majority. So it means that we need to organize the second vote. 
And it means that in the meantime, no decisions can be taken locally for budget, for investment, except for uh, current uh, spendings. So it's a big issue for the road industry and for the building industry in France, because the local authorities are the ones which, which spend the most money in terms of buildings and roads. So in, uh, in the meantime, uh, so we can we have a map here where we see the rate of ongoing uh, building uh, works, and we see that it's quite irrational because where the virus was the the, 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 the the most important, which is in the eastern part of France, this is the place where the works are at the highest rate with 31% of works going on. So it's very difficult to guess why. There are so, 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 so big differences between the regions when you consider the first map, which was where the virus was the most important. So it means that really everyone uh, took a, a local decision to decide what he has to do and what he wanted to do. One of my uh, colleagues sent me another map which has a map for general, a general color of the election. So I don't know if it's a good correlation or not, but the, the idea of this map was in the Eastern part of France, it's the majority is uh, white, right wing, while in the Southwest it's left wing. So we don't know if there's a correlation between that, but that's uh, maybe an explanation. And now it's totally rational when you compare the number of works which are going on in the building industry and in the road industry and the number of people which have been struck by the virus. So now the situation is that new sanitary rules have been put in place by all companies. It's the same, so everyone in shops, in hairdressers and everyone in big building industry and road industry, everyone has, has had to get organized uh, to make people work safely and so uh, big of big lines big works have started on new lines of underground in france and these are numbers of people employed so to make a connection with the previous uh, presentation we can say that in france the uh, government has asked all the contract all the people having con ongoing contracts to be flexible on the negotiation which means first of all not to apply penalties, considering that it was really not the contractor's responsibility to have stopped working. So the government has really passed the message of no penalty. It has even been further than that, saying, for instance, that for the big malls and for stores and shops, they shouldn't pay for the rent uh, because they couldn't have uh, turnover in France. So they, they said you should also renegotiate the uh, rental uh, contract and not to pay for the uh, monthly uh, rent. So, and the second point is that to start and to make it easier for the job to start again, the government accepted and he said, and he, and he sent this information to everyone that in the current contract, new prices could be added to take into consideration the fact that the sanitary rules would cost would cost more money, and so uh, that's why um, it's it, it really helped uh, companies to start again working uh, from the from the 11th of May. So, for instance, in Paris, in the big uh, construction sites where the new underground is going to to should be open for the Olympic Games in 2024. We can see that on the line 15, 290 people are working now compared to 694 before containment because all those were are underground. So the sanitary rules will be complicated to get organized. But if we look at the objectives for the next month, in the east of France, where the virus again has been the most important, if 30 people of people, if 30% of the people are working in April, all the industry thinks that in June. 70 to 80 percent of people will be working it's it's important compared to where we were in april but if you consider that uh, weather conditions are good in france in june that uh, working days are long because uh, it there is light uh, for 14 hours for 14 hours a week and with the organization of the working time 
uh, companies are authorized to make people work 48 hours a week, 80% is not good compared to a, to a standard to a normal year. So for the uh, next month, we don't know exactly where we go. So it's like a, a curving road with a, in, in, within a, in a fog. So we don't know exactly how things will change in the future. We can, we can because there, there, there is a certain number of questions without answers. And um, one of the questions that everyone has in his mind is which impacts uh, are the COVID have, are the, is the COVID going to have on the budgets um, spent by the authorities, by the government itself, but also by the authorities, by the authorities, because the the authorities will have to pay for masks, for sanitary rules, for more cleaning, and also they will have to spend more money for existing volume because of the price prices increases I was mentioning before. Uh, so th this is a big issue or a big question that everyone's got in his mind. What will be the evolution of the of the budget? And the second question, but it's under uh, resolution now is the second round of election in the large cities where a lot of money is spent in building, but it should, it should happen sometimes in June now. Uh, so thank you for your attention. If you've got uh, any more questions, please ask them through the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Max. So it's always good to hear from a pr practical case study and in this example it's France. So I invite everyone to ask questions to Jean-Max Jean Jean sorry, about how such and such issue may be handled in France at the moment and please use the chat for that. We'll move on to our third panelist, uh, Flavio, uh, Flavio Di Petro. Uh, thank you very much for having prepared uh, your presentation and thank you very much for your time. Uh, Flavio, the floor is yours. Thank you. Bonjour Patrick, uh, Bonjour. Buongiorno Francesco, Bonjour Jean-Max, uh, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to wherever our colleagues are connected uh, and we're virtually in Paris. So uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation done by my colleagues. Uh, I'm here to represent certain uh, post-pandemic recovery uh, uh, potential mitigation actions. If we can please flip the page. Okay, flip. I don't, uh, I'm too horrible to see. Please flip. Uh, the agenda that we decided to propose to this webinar is uh, um, structured in this way. Okay, we will start with a slight uh, and short introduction. And we decided with Francesco and Jean-Max and Patrick and Fabio, who's going to be my successor and close this webinar, to sub-level uh, the potential mitigations in three macro, macro areas, ease and support liquidity, economical and jurid juridical, and of course, contractual to land on the takeaways and leave you to uh, tease you with a lot of questions and with a lot of answers depending on the topic we are dealing with. Please go ahead. Introductions. Nothing too new to you to introduce because we're all aware wherever we are by looking at that map, the disaster we're facing and we're uh, fronting with the COVID-19 which has affected all the communities globally speaking. And as nicely Jean-Marc said, and Francesco said, and Patrick said, whilst all the governments uh, interested and, and connected and concerned and companies worldwide are responding swiftly, still a lot remains to be done. The first considerations that I recapped uh, listening to also my colleagues who anticipated me is first thing, the protecting on-site employees, no? our workforce, to reorganize the activities at site, to restore and reinstate the supply chain because we're not sure whether it's still there, if that industry is still there, ex ante, ex post. And of course, if we do not create a confidence and a reassurance atmosphere, I think we will never depart and take off the way we have to go. Most construction sites, I can speak for the Americas, North America, South America, Latin America, Europe, Africa, Middle East, and Australia, where I've got this personal and professional experience, uh, most construction sites have faced disruption and uh, in the supply chain and operational restrictions, whether the contractor notified this, whether the employer or the principal notified this. And this can be summarized in phase one, where there was a slowdown and association of activities due to impossibility to execute these contracts, where new 
uh, enforced quality health, safety environment standards and programs required to be adopted to reopen those sites due to the emergency we're facing. And of course, when new protocols that God knows what we have to invent to safeguard and, and, and uh, as a, a good father uh, implement in phase two, uh, to avoid any impact on productivity, uh, it's quite difficult to predict. Please, can we go ahead? Uh, to continue to the introduction, in a nutshell, construction companies are facing a problem of liquidity. It's devastating due to the sudden and unexpected delay suspension of operations. Who would have said this would have happened two months ago, three months ago, when it was the 20th of February? This financial crisis in this industry, in the construction industry, but in all industries, can rap rapidly see an increase in volume of actors crossing one-way limits which are not supposed to be crossed. So we can say that it's difficult to imagine a recovery plan to cater and to uh, present to this webinar and uh, it, until and even after the situation returns to normal. The only thing I think wise with common sense and good faith uh, we can do is try and find an algorithm, a solution to inject confidence and liquidity the sooner the better in the industry. And therefore, the three potential mitigation actions are summarized in what I said before, ease and support liquidity, chapter A, economical and juridical, chapter B, and contractual, chapter C. Please uh, go ahead. Regarding uh, uh, ease and support to liquidity, the negative impacts uh, to this uh, can be addressed with a number of actions uh, to be taken with a proper timing and with different modalities. Depending on the phase of the crisis, each of us are facing in each different country, even if we have a common uh, denominator. First thing, to encash the sooner, the better, any trade receivables the contractors or, 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 or the corporations are still having on, lying on their books. Try and improve and efficient the payment application process in order to accelerate the certification of interim payment certificates and applications for work performed or work executed and remodule eventually payment terms and conditions. Probably think of any advance ad hoc on account payments on works to be executed or works executed. The first thing that comes to my mind is think of the volume that material on site cubes. Advance payments uh, uh, regarding special interim payment certificates due to the emergency and surely to cater for those dead weight costs. All these um, listed uh, possibilities and mitigative uh, actions can surely a, a, a benefit at a, at a short term level and uh, can be taken with a, um, relatively ease to adopt, uh, generate an immediate impact on liquidity, which we require because if tomorrow we reopen the shops, uh, without this immediate liquidity, I doubt those shops or those construction sites will be able to open. Please go ahead. B. Here we have uh, ample colleagues that come from an economical and juridical background. Francesco can lecture us uh, many hours on this. Uh, so I try to summarize uh, what we could do. Track the actual costs incurred due to emergency in an appropriate industrial managerial uh, way to present to the client and negotiate compensation from the employer. I think that now today, the approach of the contractor and the employer has to also drastically change. It's a partnership. It's a, a way to uh, certify what has happened, which is out of the control, as Francesco said, it's an act of God. God knows if it's an act of God, and surely it is, because these costs due to new and additional quality health, safety, environment measures and protocols adopted will impact on the profit and loss account of anyone, of the contractors, of the employers, of the principals, of the governments, of us uh, citizens that pay taxes uh, every year. Lack of performance and productivity, including the suspension period, it's not said that we may be able to recover it. So surely an extension of time for those contracts in force is required, whether not only temporarily speaking, but also economically speaking. Lower productivity immediately before and after suspension period because we cannot enter in full swing as we used to. No productivity during suspension period and extension of time is very much required to complete those works and those contracts assigned. We have a case in Italy that yesterday, thanks to Anas, we uh, uh, put down the first stone of Strada Statale 106 in the Ionica dorsal 
but uh, uh, cost. So that's the first project that has started in Italy after uh, COVID-19. We need to execute contracts due to slow down and new protocols, new policies, and implement new procedures. You can imagine it's a disaster. Price revision mechanism has to increase and has to be catered for in order to cater for direct costs of production. And if this be the case, we need a direct negotiation with the employer for settlement of claims, variation orders with an amicable approach is what I was saying before. These uh, uh, mitigate, uh, mitigation actions, surely, rather than the first ones that I uh, highlighted, are more medium long-term actions that provide ongoing liquidity and assure a stable economical and financial position. Sorry, there's a mistake in my slide. I put a P instead of an F, so I, I kindly excuse myself. I will correct it. There's a typo mistake. It's not financial, but it's financial. Please flip the page. And we reach the third macro area, which is contractual. There's nothing to say besides this emergency. No? We have uh, to review the contract provisions and implement special emergency acts. The contractual re review of the safety and coordination plan, in Italian we say piano di sicurezza e coordinamento, which is vital. It was already vital before you can imagine now how more important it's going to be and we have to be have, have safety hazards before we do anything today, like it was in the past, if not more. We should review and amend work scheduling that, that takes into account the impact of these new protocols because the production cycles are not going to last as they used to last uh, ex ante COVID. They're going to take a little bit more time because there's a lot of bureaucratic activities and matters to be addressed before they go in full swing of things. And they will have a drastic uh, impact on the critical path. Article 91 of Decreto Legge number 23, 2020, and Article 6 piece of Decreto Legge number 6 of the 23rd of February 2020, converted into law number 13, exemption for the contractor, primarily considering future additional penalties and costs. Francesco spoke about it. I will not uh, focus on this uh, and I will go ahead. And therefore, we need to review. I saw a couple of questions also coming across uh, force measure provisions in the contract. If this be the case, uh, these actions represent an immediate benefit versus the supply chain, assuring protection of public interest linked to investments in infrastructure section, sector and recovery of gross domestic product, which we're all facing in this moment. Please flip the page. What do we take away? In a nutshell, the described measures that we've gone through together can be adopted by the employers to provide an immediate benefit to the supply chain, allowing uh, the uh, ongoing continuity of operations in an extremely challenging scenario. This is a new world. We have never seen this. Uh, since the post-war, World War II, whilst also improving the long-term economic recovery. And in doing so, it's de desirable a reform, it's very much required, or adaptions of the code. I'm talking for Italy, of course, which is Codice dei Contratti. Phase one, the last reform of the code, it was four years ago, the Greater Legislativo number 50, 2016, and uh, the adoption of unblocked construction site decree, the Greater's Blocker Cantieri, which we're all praying that arrives, is suspension until December 2020, most important elements of the 2016 reform. A definition of a new regulation for public interest contracts in order to override the so-called soft law. In Italy, we have ANAC guidelines and ministerial decrees and return to only one ministerial decree to adopt the code. Uncertainty regarding the adoption of the new regulation initially foreseen in January 2020. If this is phase one, of course, phase two is even more challenging because we have to adopt of the, the code by withholding portion of the code for a limited period. And it, it's difficult to imagine fast recovery of the country's economical system given the actual regulatory framework. We have to press, put pressure on our uh, uh, governors, on our governments to quickly adopt a solution which is efficient, reasonable, discussed and shared with stakeholders. We heard what jean Max said in France, we heard what Francesco said, and we heard what Patrick said. I can imagine you guys worldwide what we're all facing. Please flip the page. Here, I wanted to stimulate you all. And uh, by looking at these two pages, I tried to, with the team, uh, group these question and answers 
in macro areas. The first questions, if you look on the right hand side of the screen, are questions and answers that we can give ourselves by touching the topic of backlog, new orders, and book to build. The second category is uh, uh, direct costs and gross margin. The third category is indirect costs and EBITDA. If you, the, 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 my colleague flips one second and then comes back eh, to finish the topics, if you can please go ahead for one second. The supply chain and the working capital and finance. These are the macro areas that this group uh, of uh, finance and procurement thought uh, advisable to highlight with uh, this list of common sense questions which you can imagine the answers, they can be of uh, miscellaneous uh, uh, criteria and can be any uh, worldwide. I thank you very much and uh, I'm available for any questions uh, and uh, I please pass the floor back to Patrick. Thank you very, very much for you. Those slides were really clear, very interesting. And well, that's my opinion, but I guess everyone will uh, join me in, in those congratulations. I invite everyone to uh, share uh, their, well, experience. That's really welcome too. Uh, we've seen a French case, an Italian case, and many cases in Francesco's presentation. And please don't hesitate and, well, raise this, share it with everyone in the chat. And because we're now reaching uh, uh, the last uh, panelist presentation, uh, Fabio Pasquale. Fabio is the chair of one of our committees. Fabio, uh, if you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, thanks uh, and a welcome to everybody. Um, again, it's a pleasure to be here. Next, please. Um, next slide, please. Um, I wanted to share with, with you uh, this uh, uh, unusual image of Rome. The sky is always the same, but uh, it's right unusual, unusual to see the, the, the Panther Square without cars and vendors and tourists and so on. Well, uh, apart from my general qualifications, I'm here as an, uh, uh, a person with a wide background in economic and financial analysis uh, for road projects, road activities, and uh, uh, national road agencies in a in a planning and development scenario so that, that, that that's what i've been trying to to do today that is uh, to which extent the assessment of road project is going to be changed after this COVID era next please oh well this is a a, a general picture of the effects of COVID. it's interesting uh, not to, to to get into details but just to to acknowledge that for the first time for many years, there was a, a, a dual shock, both for uh, demand and for supply. And the major concern with this uh, uh, has been the disruption of the supply chain, ch chains, of course, a block of uh, mobility, as well as a, a financial shock. And we are going to see the uh, consequences of that. Well, I will not focus neither on, on phase one, which is over more or less in most countries worldwide, uh, nor on uh, phase two, uh, because uh, in phase two, we are just uh, going back to uh, previous activity. I will focus on phase three, the so-called new normal. Next, please. Well, um, assessing road projects, economics. Uh, what we don't know is uh, uh, where we are in phase three and uh, where are we are going to get in, in uh, where, where we are in phase two, uh, how long will it take to get in phase three, but even more important, what are we going to keep as a permanent when we will get back to, let us say, usual activities, the usual levels of activities? Let us divide into temporary changes and non temporary or definite changes. Well, um, now we are, our public transport is working at about 50% of its capacity, and, and this uh, also um, includes high speed trains, which is a long haul service uh, which is a very important role in uh, for the analysts in assessing the um, uh, model split uh, behavior and, and also we have a very low tourist flows um, this is for temporary let, let us assume that it's for phase two uh, but uh, for instance uh, we can assume that part of limited capacity of public sport, uh, transport will remain and we will have for sure that smart, smart working and uh, to a certain extent, also smart study will remain as a basis for future uh, economic uh, assessments. 
Um, working our differentiation, well, it depends. Uh, um, now we are forced to do that, but we are probably understanding that if you decide to spread out all our commercial activities in a wider uh, uh, period during the day, uh, provides um, benefits uh, to the whole community as well as to the environment. So we can also expect that some of these uh, travel patterns will, will, will continue also in the future. Then there is the, the issue of the preference for individual mobility. It's too early to say if we are going back to uh, um, uh, cars with just one driver. I don't think that will be the case also for environmental restriction that will be on, on place uh, also in the future, as well as economic reasons in terms of the personal budget of the commuters and the users. But we, we, we may assume that, and we also are seeing for now, that light mobility and clean mobility uh, will certainly uh, uh, improve in terms of uh, number of people, in terms of uh, priorities of the communities in uh, defining the policies. We, 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 we are seeing it in many parts of our, of our cities and not only cities. Uh, well, transport modeling is a challenge now. It's a challenge now. Uh, and next slide, please. And let us try and understand uh, why. Well, we're moving from a very uh, traditional um, um, transport modeling uh, scheme towards a very difficult, a very different situation. We use it to, uh, to have a region and, and destination at a couple of uh, peak or at least four peak period of, of the day uh, with very well identified groups of, uh, of travelers. Um, which is not the case anymore. We are now in a multi-market and a multi-hour transport arena. But again, it's not only for phase two. We are certainly going to see some of these different uh, modeling needs also in the next future. Uh, which are the, the aspects that we have to reconsider? Well, transport demand. Uh, let us try and make this society one of the last cost-benefit analysis that, that we've been carried on in the last uh, years. Let us apply a, a smart working factor uh, to uh, our uh, demand groups, uh, well, very high or higher for white colors and virtually zero for blue colors. But we will understand that we, our demand flows uh, can dramatically change depending on project and cases. And then again, value time. We are using now in this period to queue, waiting for a train or a bus to be empty enough to be uh, uh, used by us uh, as the travelers. Um, I'm not saying that it will go on in the next future, but I'm, uh, I'm saying that, uh, for instance, the value of time reliability, which was one of the core objects of our um, PRTC in the last four years, can be uh, can decrease dramatically in the sense that if it's assumed that you may uh, get into your working place with one hour uh, delay because safety is a, a more important goal in collective terms, it means that we are probably going to change our parameters when we apply uh, the uh, benefit factors in order to have the calculation uh, to get to the full um, profitability of the project. Uh, and then transport hubs can play a, a new and different role because um, mode changing uh, um, from collective to individual, from heavy, let us say, to light, uh, from bus to bicycles, uh, to bicycles uh, must be carried on in a very efficient way um, thereby minimizing the time necessary for being clean and safe. And uh, it's probably going to change the role and the way to operate them as well. And then let us not forget, last but not least, that recession, uh, recession or stagnation is ahead. It's a, an economic uh, downturn, which is going to, uh, there is no time to, to, to pass through uh, the, the comparisons between this crisis and the effect that already been dramatically achieved and the, 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 the great financial crisis, but we are, we are, we are bad, bad times ahead. Well, which is the final result? We are going to lose traffic. We are going to lose benefits. We are going to have less MPV, a lower uh, IRR, uh, because um, if we go on in uh, assessing traffic in the same way, or even if we decide to register those, those changes, uh, provided that costs will not decrease, unfortunately they will increase, uh, uh, and we already know that we have to take into account, as, as I said earlier, this additional cost for the construction and so on. Well, we will have a different uh, situation for our projects. Next, please. 
And now we get to, to the funding. Uh, next, please. Thanks, thanks, Perry. Merci. Uh, well, uh, what about funding? I, I will not um, get into financing uh, because there is not, not that much time for that. But, well, uh, we have been um, um, helped by, by the governments, I mean, we as a national road agencies, uh, because they, they provided, in some cases, they usually provided it, uh, but uh, also in the cases where our revenues uh, derived from toll collection or, for, or from uh, at, uh, excise linked to um, uh, gas and, uh, and gasoline. Well, we have been uh, given the money and we will be given the, the money for ordinary activities, operation and maintenance for obvious reasons. But this uh, fully coverage of the states will certainly not include also investments. So uh, we will have to revise our investment plans. But uh, this, uh, the, the, the picture is not the same. So we, we will have to consider I propose here just three uh, new dimensions or references. The first one is just asset management as a key principle. Uh, it will be uh, more and more difficult to be new roads, uh, also for the usual reasons, uh, but uh, we will have to uh, concentrate on uh, uh, um, um, reinforcing our network, building residents uh, with a strong injection both of innovation and rise in productivity. Uh, we have been scrutinized, I mean, we as a public servant have been dramatically scrutinized, scrutinized in this period and uh, we had to respond in, uh, from both this point of view. Then integration, uh, well, uh, we had to work in terms of supply chains and demand chains. Why? Because it's the way it has been working in this uh, dramatic period. And these uh, uh, chains have to be based on safety, uh, resilience and environment. Well, but this is not a, 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 an abstract uh, way of thinking. This is not the general uh, object that we know. We have to find the way to put value into our project so as it's possible to demonstrate that these uh, dimensions create value, create money, and provide some confidence to the lenders in, 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 in terms of uh, possible revenues, uh, regular revenues that can be associated to these events, to these facts that we are going to bring about with, with this new concept. And then uh, revise the welfare parameters, safety nets uh, versus travel time. So we are used to base our analysis on, on a couple of parameters, number of accidents, uh, emissions, and the, travel, the, whole, the whole travel time issue. Uh, well, we have to uh, start and think in a little bit different way. So I think we, sh we, we have to move uh, towards a full spectrum mobility plus environment operator scheme. Uh, th th this, is, uh, this not only means that we are going to get into the general arena of mobility as a service uh, panorama. It's a little bit more, uh, we have an occasion to uh, raise some, uh, some revenues, to collect some money, but provided that we integrate our activity into these chains based on environment, and new needs or new ways to consider needs. It's not easy, of course, but we have to be read not only to bear the losses associated to the energy transition due to the fact that uh, many more electric vehicles will be on the road in, in the next future, but also considering that the scarcity of money will force us to convince the government that we are important not only in terms of emergency, but also uh, being the players, uh, some key players for the future, future way of understanding uh, road infrastructures. Well, um, this is the way, uh, the COVID-19 is the way to help us to speed up this transition. Next one, please. Uh, well, a couple of words about uh, PPPs. Uh, uh, well, um, what's going to happen? Uh, the, the situation is very clear. Three cases, uh, well, uh, very, very hard times for uh, projects uh, re uh, based on the real toll as well as mostly on traffic. Um, this, this is, well, uh, um, a downturn in, uh, in toll collection is, a, is a, a dramatic issue for anybody, but if you are in the ramp up phase, it's, it's worse. Uh, but uh, also for the availability based contracts in which the uh, traffic component is relevant, uh, uh, we are hard times. Uh, in between so and so, well, uh, already established toll-based projects, 
Uh, why? Because uh, they are 34 year uh, projects and so they, in some cases, they can bear losses uh, and they can consider the uh, possibility of uh, um, uh, uh, getting back the money through an extension of the uh, franchise term. We, we have seen through the PR examiners that in some countries they uh, have allowed, um, government has allowed uh, the giving um, the entity giving the, the, the concession and the contractors, the, the MPBs, to sit and uh, and discuss a possible rescheduling of the of the term. Um, who is going to do a robust projects, of course, uh, with uh, sound economic groundings, uh, uh, risk traffic uh, virtually zero, or or also high remunerative, high really remunerative projects we are able to absorb. Uh, well, uh, Fitch has recently rated, not positive, uh, it's a mistake, uh, positive and uh, um, uh, um, uh, regular, that is not negative, 75% of its PPP infrastructure project. So uh, the negative outlook, negative look only uh, relates uh, some 25% uh, uh, of the project. Why? Because in most cases, there are provisions for uh, recover, as, a, as I said, through uh, uh, extension of the, of the franchise or redefinition of this contract, or because there is the belief that the uh, phase two period will not last that long, of course. Well, what for new uh, PPPs? Well, uh, first of all, finance is still available for uh, transport infrastructures. Uh, the need for this project is still in place, and these um, uh, bonds or let us say financial um, uh, obligations are still defensive in the sense that are still behaving this way. Uh, but we have some core issues. Some of them has been uh, very, very uh, at a high level, like high level uh, discussed by my colleagues. But uh, uh, building flexibility into, into contract arrangements, well. Um, uh, concessions are the enemies of flexibility, as we know, uh, and uh, it, bring, it will bring some problems. Uh, and then at the end of the day, less traffic and higher covenants and a higher debt service cover ratio means that uh, projects are less profitable for private investors or that the part of the risk, a higher part of the risk is to be uh, buried with the, uh, between the three players, uh, the state, the banks and the and the and the privates, and we can add a fourth player, which is the insurance company. So there is a, a, a matter of how to share this risk, but overall there will be a loss. And then we have to update uh, as, as soon as possible this <coughs> this uh, traffic modeling uh, traffic models. Ne uh, last uh, next and last list, and then we get to uh, our takeaway. Where <coughs> on the left part. Uh, of the slide, you see uh, an interesting um, um, declaration made by uh, the head of the PPP expertise center between the investment, the European Investment Bank. It says that more or less in better terms, uh, <coughs> what we have been trying to say so far, uh, new, uh, new picture, something will change forever. Then uh, getting to the right side, uh, well, this is the, the occasion to update our reviews about mobility, transport system, and so on. But again, it's not a, an abstract exercise. It's a do or die issue. Public money will be under high competitions, and we had to reschedule our projects anyhow in most cases. On the um, um, bottom left, you see the situation, and thanks to Tim Henkel, one of my uh, T, um, um, TC members, he provided his uh, uh, updated figures with number of states of USA where uh, projects have been delayed, cancelled, or just uh, in big concern as far as, uh, as revenues are concerned. And you see also a quantitative estimate of this amount of, uh, of uh, uh, revenues that are going to be lost or just postponed. Uh, um, the big or the bad news is that this situation, uh, this do and die exercise applies to all countries, not only countries where PPP and uh, infrastructure are well developed, but it's, it's wrong for everybody. We have to create a new, uh, innovative ways to, to inject uh, economic benefit uh, calculated in a different way into our projects. And uh, by, uh, as a conclusion, PRC is the ideal place to get a repository of this updated 
CBAs for road projects for uh, public or PPPs from the economic and financial uh, viewpoints. Thanks again. Ready for um, Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabio. Uh, it was a very sharp, clear, detailed presentation. Like our other panelists, that's very, very interesting indeed. Uh, everyone, please ask questions in the chat or share your point of view. This is really welcome because we're now entering the Q&A phase of our session. Uh, this is moderated by Christos, Christos Xenophontos from Rhode Island DOT in the US of A, uh, is the chair of our committee on performance of transport administrations. So he, he's kindly agreed to uh, uh, lead this part. Christos, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you once again to all of our presenters for the excellent material that they shared with us today. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for, uh, you know, for being here as well. Uh, I see that uh, we have quite a few questions and some of the questions um, really seem to have spurred some interest in discussion on the chat box. Um, so uh, today we'll try and uh, do a little bit of a roundtable discussion with our presenters on a couple of the issues that uh, they seem to be of interest in. And uh, we'll start with the um, force majeure or act of God. Uh, it seems to a um, few questions on that. And uh, we'll start with Francisco, Jean-Marc, Fabio and Flavio and see um, uh, what you think. Um, has COVID-19 been uh, accepted by governments and courts internationally as an act of God, uh, force majeure, or is that still unknown and it's a country by country uh, definition? Um, Francisco, could we start with you on that one, please? I think that the answer is that there is a country by country definition for sure, because as I say, the, uh, the, the old contract uh, are to be executed under a specific law. So we have to give a look to the Russian law more than the Polish one, to the Italian one, or I don't know, whatever. And that we have to apply the, the meaning of force majeure under the applicable law. For sure, there are general principles, for example, the European one, if the, 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 the member state is, uh, uh, is asked to, 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 to interpret the force majeure clause that have to be respected. Uh, so uh, the, the, the meaning is a national uh, one, but uh, have to be checked if the, 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 there are more general principles that are uh, applicable. So the follow-up follow question, and I will ask the same question of uh, our other panelists as well, then would be, uh, um, are you aware it, if it has been exposed to any legal challenge in uh, any particular uh, country? For sure, there are uh, a number of cases in which the, pro the, 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 the question of uh, if the COVID-19 uh, have to be uh, Considered as a force majeure event is uh, under the, on the table of a number of, of, of people involved in the execution of contract. As said by by the, 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 the colleague before, there are a lot of problems related to the postponement of deadline, to the uh, higher cost for or, um, for for safety reason related to the execution of contract that have to be managed directly with the, with the contracting authority. So there are a number of cases in which the problem is actually to be managed in all the jurisdiction. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Uh, Jean-Max, if I could ask the question so, of you as well, please. Yes. Um, I think that the answer is included in the uh, global uh, decisions taken by the government. The French government has uh, spent so much money, such a huge amount of money, to try to uh, to make the economy survive, that uh, contracts and renegotiation within existing contract is part of the deal, because it would be a nonsense to have invested so much money, public money, uh, to support the economy and then for a certain number of contracts to say, okay, we don't want to renegotiate anything. So the renegotiation, I think, is included within the global uh, 
plan of the French government to support the economy. And that's why even the, the French government even went further, what I said in my presentation regarding the uh, rental monthly, the, the monthly rents paid by the shops or the stores or all those uh, shops which had been closed for two weeks, for two months. And he said, okay, ne renegotiated with the uh, owners of the buildings, the payment of the rent. Because as you, didn't have, as you didn't have any turnover, you cannot pay a rent. And so the government is really pushing to renegotiate the contract to make sure that as many companies as possible survive. Is my answer complete? Or Thank you. Enough? Yes, thank you, Jean Max. Actually, you even I believe you actually even uh, answered one of the later questions that Patrick <laughs> posted as well. No, this is good. Sorry, um, about no, that's good actually. Uh, Fabio, uh, well, um, first sorry. of all, uh, sorry, the sorry, first part, excuse me. I don't know if you said Fabio, Flavio. Sorry, yeah, Flavio, oh, Fabio, uh, Fabio, Fabio first. first. You're right. Sorry, sorry. Fabio was okay. Fabio, okay. okay. I need uh, to practice my Italian better. <laughs> no, we had to. If you had too many Italians, it's, it's the risk you, you, you know. Now, uh, well, the first part of my answer has been taken by Jean Max. Well, it's a part of the deal. So it's, uh, it's a nonsense if, if the government is going to spend this money and excluding contractors or, or that part of the, of the situation. But uh, uh, in more general terms, I think that uh, the answer to your first question is that uh, we are uh, in a poker playing uh, exercise. That is, the, the, the players are the uh, UK uh, authorities, the uh, Spain authorities, the French authorities, and so on, in the sense that Everybody is trying to understand what the others are doing with respect to the money to be spent or the way to share um, the losses. In my view, the entire community uh, is going to, to discuss how to share uh, the enormous uh, loss of money that, 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 that we are incurring in. Uh, we did not yet start to why, but I, I don't think that uh, a, the, the litigation will go on on a case-by-case -case basis, basis or a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, one of our panelists, Flavio, belongs to, we built uh, one of the major building companies worldwide. He, he's shown us that they are working in many places in the world. So I don't think it, it would be appropriate if they are going to get money in some places and some others they are not going to. Uh, this is big family, PPP and contracting. And I think that uh, common rules will be defined at the end, or uh, at least in terms of general uh, guidelines. Thank you, Fabio. And uh, Flavio, you, um, you floor? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, nothing to add to my colleagues, uh, Francesco, Jean-Marc, Fabio, but I'd like to uh, say something rather than answering your question. Even if COVID-19 is within the scope of our fourth major provision, before we claim such a force major, we need to consider carefully the impact of the coronavirus on our ability to perform our contractual obligations and whether that impact, of course, meets the standards required by the provision. This is a difficult question to answer because we all know that, as Francesco said, as, as Jean Max has said, as Fabio said, surely it's foreseen. But then it's foreseen. Can we cope with what I've just said? Fabio, actually, that is a really good question, and um, may I add on that? Yes, so that was good. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, no, it's it's a very uh, well well done uh, uh, question because the, the the if the answer it's easy or not, uh, COVID nineteen it's a, it's a problem for the execution of contract or not? The answer can be easy to be given, yes, but what does it mean exactly from an execution point of view, from an economic point of view, in terms of higher cost, uh, uh, postponement of delay, uh, mitigation of uh, new costs to be taken by the provider, the, the contract uh, uh, provider, as, and so on. This is what is difficult to be done, on, and that's to be done on a, on a single case, uh, uh, for sure. It's not possible to provide a general rule saying, 
uh, all the costs uh, suffered by the company during the year can be managed on and taken by the contract authorities. For sure, it's a very case-by-case -case approach that will be followed. And uh, this is the reason for which uh, uh, it's important to be aware that the right, the right way to manage it is starting from the contract, starting from the applicable rules, and then trying to understand if there is a, 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 a general consensus, consensus on the approach to be taken, because for sure, the, 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 the higher costs related for the, for the workforce uh, in, uh, uh, to be used for the execution of contract. It's uh, uh, an element to, to, be, to be taken uh, or to be lived on the, on the contract authority. Uh, and uh, I don't know, the, the, uh, the higher cost for, uh, for the money that have to be uh, taken by the contract, uh, uh, by, the, by the contractor have to be managed and how in the execution of contract. The postponement and the market risk related to the, to the availability of the project to the market, it's a, a risk to be managed how between the, 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 the risk sharing between contracting authority and contract and so on. All the questions that have been exactly raised by Fabio uh, uh, can be analyzed in general terms but have to be applied on a single, on a, on a case by case approach, because otherwise uh, the litigation that, that can, uh, can go out from, uh, from the COVID-19, it takes uh, year and year, and this is the risk to be avoided. The, the, the general approach that have to be shared, in my opinion, from a, a, from a very uh, policy point of view is the COVID-19 is a risk to be managed to save projects, to minimize the impact, to uh, save the execution and uh, to save the, uh, the, 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 the deadline expected to be realized, and also to maintain workforce and to save the, the, contract, the contractor that are engaged in the execution. If we lead everything to the, let me say, uh, uh, public subsidy approach that are going to be used in, in EU at least, but not only, uh, uh, saying uh, it's, a, it's a common problem. Uh, we have to, to, to take the cost of the execution on the, on the public body. Uh, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare that have to be avoided and uh, that have to be managed carefully because it's a, it's a very high risk uh, <laughs> otherwise for the execution of the contract, globally safe. Thank you, Francisco. Um, it's definitely, um, we know that it's a new world um, and that uh, new, new, new future contracts um, would definitely be different to reflect the risk of the pandemic. Um, with that in mind, I'll start uh, the next question with Fabio. What's the economic cost of that and how should the capital be raised? Fabio? <clears throat> yes, Christoph, thanks. Um, it, it is possible, uh, uh, even if it's a burdensome exercise to, to assess the economic cost. Um, the point is that um, in order to share this cost, we had to make some considerations. Well, we have the state, and if, if, if the state is going to bear the majority of that, and it's a model that known of us last that much, as also Francesco Cialone said, uh, you just move it to taxpayers and next generations because it's, it's debt, uh, it's uh, debt is pending and debt. If we um, give it to the lenders, well, um, you are going to suffer because if the banking system is not strong enough, it will be difficult for the system to, to go on in providing finance, even with the with QA and the uh, uh, European EEC policy. And if you uh, just uh, ask the contractors to bear it, you have uh, major effects on the industry. Um, last year in Italy uh, with ANAS, uh, we uh, had some uh, 50 uh, between middle scale and major firms uh, who made bankrupt because of, of, of difficulties in, uh, for payments. So if you are going to, 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 to give the burden to them, you will have consequences on the industry as well as on the stock exchange market because uh, the major uh, contractors as well as the major banks 
are listed. So uh, also uh, private investors will lose out of them. Uh, the point is that um, try to remember what happened at some 20 uh, years ago or more. Well, I started working in the road concessions in 1992, and the, the first project was the Hungarian M1 M15 toll uh, um, Prague to Wien uh, motorway. Uh, I don't know if some of you remembers that it was a, a substanding project, so with no guarantees at all, and it was a, a, a drama for the investors because uh, the, the traffic uh, was well below the, uh, the, the forecasts. So it took time to understand that if the entity that grants the concession and the concessionaire decide to share the cost, that, that is, the state is providing some guarantees, the overall cost of the project will be lower because of less costly finance as well as other benefits. So my answer is uh, the, the, the only way to uh, understand uh, how much will be uh, is to understand that everybody has to take his part of it because what is uh, unforeseeable by definition cannot be ruled by law or by contracts in my view. But it's, it's an economist's point of view, it's not the law you point of view. Thank you, Fabio. Jean Max. Um, I I don't have really anything to add to what has been said. Okay, uh, <laughs> Flavio. Yes, uh, uh, I just wanted to add, if you allow me, that uh, if we do uh, mitigate the fourth major provisions that party that is seeking this kind of relief because it's clear that it's going to have a devastating impact on our profit and loss account and our networking capital and our net financial position being corporations worldwide whether a principal whether employer whether contractor once you've demonstrated that you have mitigated to the extent possible any impact whatever the impact may be we've spoke about it during today's session qualitatively speaking workforce planning wise supply chain so it's not only a consequence of economical or financial or balance sheet or networking capital, net financial position, because you could have also have mitigated those variables. But what happens in the case of Italy, where Fabio, I think, or Francesco was reminding everybody that that industrial sector that uh, until last year, there were 10 companies, uh, top 10 of the construction industry. Today, maybe there are three, there are two. You can imagine the supply chain where it's gone to is no longer there. So even if I demonstrate my principle and my employer that I have mitigated to the extent possible, we have to also be aware that in many cases, but not all cases, if we were in England, the English law implies a provision into these contracts of obliging the party suffering such a loss to mitigate that loss. But I don't have an umbrella to stop the rain that can cover me from hail, from snow, but I can only have an umbrella to cover ourselves from rain. I'm talking as a contractor, of course. So really, what does this mean? to demonstrate and to cover ourselves. Even if I've done my homework in a well-mannered fashion, tomorrow I risk to land at site and I look around and I don't have the army, I don't have the force, I don't have the industrial cycle, the production cycle that I had until yesterday to execute those contracts. So I'm back to square number one. Flavio, you raised a couple of uh, really excellent points. Um, and one, for example, that you can see through uh, what you just said is that um, even at best, there has been uh, a loss of productivity uh, and it's a key issue. And are you aware if it has been measured and if uh, any case studies have been done? Uh, we are busy together with the group uh, and uh, headed by Francesco and uh, Fabio and Federica, which I saw is connected to um, make this study because uh, this study, I'm of the moderate opinion, the humble opinion, it can help the industry in which we belong because uh, without studying what went wrong, what has to be done, the best practices, the lesson learned, I think we will go nowhere. This is my humble opinion. Uh, Jean Max, that, are you? Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, just wait on that because Fabio's point is a very is a very crucial one. Uh, uh, you know that as as, as Grimaldi, we are covering more or less forty jurisdictions, and we are also working on on all these jurisdictions, covering it, a, a study on the impact of COVID nineteen to understand what does it mean in all these uh, in uh, in these cases. 
and uh, uh, the approach, uh, the general approach to be taken is, uh, is very important because if the fairness of the approach proposed by a contractor to a, a public body is, uh, um, is shared by other public administration, but other contracting authorities, it's for sure easier for this, uh, this administration to follow a, a different approach from the strict application of the contract or the traditional approach taken in, in the jurisdiction. So it's totally right. And the PIAC is, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a perfect uh, example on how uh, uh, general consensus, consensus can be uh, originated uh, uh, around this kind of problem and the approach to be followed. Because it's very important that to save the project, the risk have to be uh, uh, shared and managed between the parties in order to save the project. Because otherwise, a, a too strict approach on the application of a, a single rule or single uh, legislation or judicial decision can be, uh, can be realized the opposite effect expected. So it's very important, and I think that Patrick can help also on that, that Pierre can have a role in sharing global view that can be perceived as helpful for the management of the project and to save the project and the execution of all this project all around the world. Uh, I, we fully agree that uh, this is a case uh, where global bodies really need to look at the impact and provide some definitions. And uh, um, if there are additional information uh, that you can um, provide relative to case studies or, uh, you know, links to websites, you know, we'll be happy to provide them as well. Um, you know, uh, Jean-Max, um, as part of what we are seeing is that uh, we're hearing a lot about uh, maybe uh, relocation or production. And while some of it might have to do with iPhones, um, that doesn't necessarily have a tremendous impact on uh, on transport. Um, but if um, construction equipment uh, uh, manufacturing now it's um, it's shifted over, let's say, to Europe or in the United States, uh, which would be more expensive than China. How is this relocation of uh, production lines going to impact uh, construction? Um, regarding the, relo the relocation, nothing has been said in France regarding the uh, road industry or building industry. Everyth uh, all the information which has been given or the ideas which have been uh, published were uh, concerning the uh, automotive industry and all about the uh, chemistry and uh, sanitary products, but nothing really has been thought about relocating uh, the industry uh, for the equipment, for instance, for the road industry. There is no, this, this hasn't been taken into consideration until now, but maybe that's something which should be looked at. Thank you, Jean Bags. Um, Fabio, uh, we, you know, one thing that we have seen is that transport demand has been impacted in multiple ways, um, you know, as a result of COVID-19. Are you aware of any um, actual studies on this that you can share with our audience? Thanks, <clears throat> Christos. Well, first of all, uh, you, you, I don't know if you're probably aware of the fact that ANAS now is a, is a part of the uh, Italian railway company and we established a, a, a bi-modal uh, transport team in order to uh, monitor uh, the behavior uh, now, in the next future, and in, in, uh, also later on. What's new, and it's also part of the terms of reference of our TC, is that many um, um, data are available and they are very cheap and they are also, um, well, they are real-time data. It's, it's, it's the famous big data, for instance, coming from uh, mobile phones and so on. Uh, all uh, major uh, road agencies uh, have uh, already started to use those data uh, by combining that uh, source with uh, automatic uh, traffic uh, counting devices so that uh, we, we, we can try and understand um, as fast as possible was changing in, in their behavior. 
uh, we, we have to take care also uh, with respect to irrigation productive lines uh, uh, of the fact that uh, it may be that some countries uh, may decide to uh, um, recreate a national uh, industry or uh, factories uh, where, for instance, uh, health masks are manufactured because the uh, population uh, accepts to pay them more than in the case of an import from a far country because of the um, strategic importance of that. So something could also change with respect to possible general choices may, uh, made by the government. And this is what we had to look at. When I was talking about the uh, new demand and supply chain, I was encouraging all of us of thinking of new way to consider projects in which we, do, we not only uh, count present uh, traffic flows, uh, but also additional activities and additional values for the collectivity. We will start to do that in our TC, of course. Thank you, Fabio. Um, Francesco, you know, and, and uh, we'll ask this question of all of our panelists, but we'll start with Francesco. Should governments launch public projects in order uh, to support construction companies? And should the governments leverage the support they provide to try and steer industry strategy in specific directions? Uh, for example, towards, uh, you know, um, cleaner transport. Is this a good thing? I think that we are facing a, a new era uh, that is characterized by the public intervention in the economy. So, <clears throat> for example, in, in Europe, uh, in the last three months, have been approved not less than 160 uh, state aid regime to support economy. Uh, and for sure, what is expected is that public uh, economic intervention in the specific sector will be seen as uh, uh, the, 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 the real driver to, to, to develop, to improve, and uh, to expect a growth in, uh, in uh, all uh, new uh, uh, specific sector. So it's essential that all this intervention will be done. And in my opinion, it is also uh, essential that this public intervention will be done involving the stakeholders. So what is important is that uh, the, the, the public money will be spent uh, in order to improve uh, private investment capability and not to destroy the market where it has been realized with the effort of private competitors during the time. Uh, but it's a completely new era, uh, I repeat, at you level, uh, uh, as you know, state aid have been uh, prohibited uh, during, uh, during the time as uh, the most uh, strict rule to be applied, uh, not only because the one that was uh, provided by the treaty, but uh, the, the, because the consensus at your level was in the sense that no state aid but never, and only if it is strictly necessary. Now we are facing a completely different uh, approach. And uh, it's important to use public money it's important to focus public money where it is expected to realize a higher growth in terms of GDP and uh, workforce involved. Uh, but it's important also, and it's my strong suggestion on that, to involve the stakeholders of the sector, to involve the, the market in, in the use of public money. Because I make reference, for example, to the construction sector that is well represented by like we did today, that is a, a, one of the, the most important contractor uh, action in the world. The public intervention in the sector of construction company is essential because, but, but has to be realized with their involvement. Uh, it's important to understand what is necessary in which kind of project is, are necessary, for example, and the same for automotive. We, we, we thought there are a lot of discussion about the crisis of automotive and how to support this kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, relaunch for the, for the sector. Uh, the same for uh, electricity, mobility, and so on. All these sectors have to be realized with the involvement of the stakeholders. It's essential to understand exactly what is necessary and how to set the market and to improve the market already existing. Thank you, Francisco. Jean Max? Should the governments launch public uh, projects to support construction companies? And uh, should they leverage that support to steer strategy? 
um, I think the situation in France is maybe a, a special one because before the COVID, the industry, uh, building and road industry was quite booming because of very big projects, as I mentioned it in my presentation, which had been uh, launched before, like the <coughs> big uh, contracts, big works of uh, underground lines within the Paris and regions. And so I think the before the COVID-19, the, uh, the business is there. It's been stopped, but it's there for the, for the very big contract. So I think the, the, the question is more, it's not really on new construction because once the uh, construction which are started, which were on their way before will be at 100% again, the, the, I think the company will, will have a good, good businesses. The problem is more regarding local authorities, as I, as I was mentioning it before. Local authorities, which spend most of the money regarding mainly infrastructure maintenance, which is either buildings or roads. And the impact on their budgets of, other, of expenses that they didn't have in mind before maybe could impact uh, their uh, their budget to be spent on roads. So the question is, how is the government to support, is going to support the budgets of local authorities? And so we can guess that it's it's some somewhere on the table of the Minister of the Finance, but we don't have real information now. And how is it going to um, to be challenged or to be, yes, to be challenged and to be balanced between the... Uh, ecologist uh, or environmental um, uh, perspectives of the government because it is under pre the government is under pressure of the ecologists regarding measures to take into account uh, better take into account the uh, climate change and so is it going to spend more money for instance on building new uh, electric or uh, loading system to develop the electric car or is it going to spend money in existing roads so we don't know exactly there are lots of um, documentation regarding in, in newspapers in magazines etc so, but we, we cannot we, we, we can't say really now how things will be decided but the big issue is not really on new construction because i think they will start again and they are, they are started again and they will really uh, start again completely in the coming month. The, 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 I think the question is regarding the budgets of local authorities and we don't have really a good answer now. We know that the um, trade association works with the public administration that and with the Ministry of the Finance, but we don't have the decision right now. Thank you, Jean-Max. Fabio? Thank you. Um, well, I, I do agree on the fact that the government uh, uh, should act as a core player for um, uh, countrycycling expenses, uh, as uh, it usually does in those cases, but as it has started again to do uh, following a rebalancing of the state versus uh, liberalism uh, debate that we had in the last decades. Uh, the point is that uh, I think that this is the good occasion to uh, use this money for a, a, a different idea of uh, mobility related to work. I don't think that mobility related to leisure is going to change that much. I think that the organization of the activities mostly in the metropolitan areas as well as uh, for what is related to uh, commuter uh, transportation is going to change. So I think that the best way to, uh, to help the economy as well as to, well, to carry on this uh, um, activity for the state is to reconsider all the package of investments related to infrastructures and to green transition, uh, understanding if something is to be uh, included uh, or if uh, there are other kinds of infrastructures uh, to be created, less vertical, more integrated, more connected, more multi-client, multi-purpose. This could be the challenge. One of the, one of the people who was attending now wrote that uh, the economists must end up with their game uh, in assessing economic benefits in, 
in a traditional way. I do agree, but we, first of all, we as NRA have to uh, help the government to select at the best by presenting new projects or at least projects uh, were uh, able to consider at the same time our previous green goals uh, adjusted with the need to reinforce our assets as uh, Jean-Max said so clearly. Thank you, Fabio. And uh, Flavio? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I must say, and please pardon me, it's a shame that our governors and our governments don't look at the history. History has always told us that investments in infrastructures is the only right instrument to restart the engine. Without going deeply into this, this implicates where to invest, urbanization, sustainability, and surely look at today's webinar. <laughs> if we don't invest in technology to achieve sustainability in an infrastructure, <laughs> technology is a great help that can only come from technology. So uh, if we don't keep this in mind, with all the beautiful words and with all the beautiful missions and visions and things that we've discussed today and that have been discussed reading the newspapers, infrastructure has to start stand up because it's still on its knees. It's not enough what they're doing. And specifically for Italy, with our colleagues, we have seen that if we nominate a commissioner that has full power to manage the show as the orchestra director, it can be done. And this is a tremendous boost to the economy. It's a tremendous boost for the government on a fiscal point of view. It allows to raise the demand. And as you well know, if the demand is risen, the offer has to cater for the demand, which is no longer there. So one silly example, with all the plant and equipment that we have at sites, if one of those machines of one of those plants break down today, we are unable to recover a spare part to put that machine back on track and full swing of production cycle. Flavio, thank you so much. And uh, thank you really for the, you know, um, passionate and uh, great way of closing. Um, uh, you know, your response was so powerful that uh, I don't dare go into any more discussion. So, um, you know, uh, with your permission, I would like to uh, turn it over to Patrick with one last question. Um, thank our presenters for uh, the excellent information that they've shared with us and everybody who's been here with us today uh, for their time. And Patrick, uh, one last question to you, please, as we close. Uh, what uh, future um, uh, offerings uh, are we seeing from PyArk on this? Thank you very much, Christos. Uh, yes, uh, I'll, I'll be quick. So. Next steps is we will publish the video recording and the presentations from this webinar, uh, and it will go on the same page as the, as, uh, as was the case for previous webinars. We're planning future webinars two weeks from now on urban transport, the impact on the COVID crisis on urban transport. Uh, we publish notes with the findings from those webinars. I also invite you to check the next issue of the Root Roads magazine, where Christos and other colleagues uh, are publishing an excellent article on the work done so far. But what I'm hearing today and is that we need, well, the world is changing. Uh, that's not really news, but there's an accelerated need for in-depth discussion and awareness and learning from each other. Uh, that's one. There's also a need for coordination, maybe. That's not necessarily what we do at PRC, but sharing knowledge and uh, highlighting what works here or there is something we are very good at, and we will certainly, certainly do that. The webinar today touched upon very important uh, topics for the medium to long, long term term probably and uh, we will probably adjust the terms of reference of some of our committees if needed so that they can really work on these topics and present their ideas or findings maybe at the end of this year or next year because that will make need a little bit of time to 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 measure to collect those ideas and encapsulate so thank you very much if you want to contribute uh, questions or to volunteer for the next webinar this is welcome you can check those links they are also on our website having said that these are the contact details of all our response team members. Don't hesitate and contact any of us. That's really welcome. Those email addresses will be on the video recording as well. You don't need to note them down. And having said that, John Christos is thanking our panelists and thanking Christos for the work done uh, in preparing the webinar and in preparing the presentations and making it happen. Thank you everyone for your attention. And with this, I would like to bring our session today to its close. Thank you very much and uh, take care. Thanks.